Let's continue with our human influence in the environment. And yeah, we did see oil spills and the detrimental effect. We see that sewage ruins our environment. And when we start to look for what is the reason, the reason is, number one, overpopulation. The reason number two, do we care enough to find solutions? And if you are part of a municipality or the government, you really have to know, have a lot of knowledge to manage all the waste. And nonetheless, we are going to look at undesirable effects of inorganic waste today. And, yeah, of course, what is inorganic waste? Toxic chemicals, and we look at toxic chemicals like lead, mercury, and arsenic. And this, unfortunately, ends up in our soil. And the moment when it is in the soil, it can be in the water. It can lead to boreholes, to water bodies. And the effect of this is it will cause bioaccumulation. It will increase in concentration in an organism. And when that organism is being eaten and we have moving down a food chain, eventually we have biomagnification in the food chain. And it leads to various health problems, which we will discuss now as we continue to um, all the different ways that we can find. If we look at toxic soup of hazardous waste, heavy metals, solvents, organic chemicals, municipal waste, inorganic waste, pesticides, paints and all way, oil waste that we just rinse under our taps, sludges. About 300 to 700 million tons per year where must it be changed and um, getting disposed of? 90% is waste water, which is diluted, but it contains enough material. Grade 12, lots of waste produced. Now, radiation and toxic waste. What can we do with the radiation and toxic waste. Yes, we can bury it in soil. We can do that. We can make a deep grave and we can put it in there. Or what about our lovely, huge, unused Namib Desert? There are many countries that offered us lots of money because we have this vast areas of only sand and sand and sand. It's not important. Nothing can live there. No, we know that we have a rich ecosystem. We know that we need the Dhamab Desert because it's bringing in a lot of money for our country by tourism. It is a place where we see as our place to camp, to relax. Do we keep it safe? Or what about the ocean? The ocean is stretching over millions of kilometers and it's deep so we can fill it up with a lot of waste. Now, the sad thing is that the oceans are the factories of oxygen with all the plants and ecosystems happening there. The ocean is the breeding ground 
for food. We eat fish. We eat a <coughs> excuse me a lot of products that's coming from the ocean, and the ocean cannot be the graveyard for all the toxic chemicals. So, yeah, Chernobyl, Ukraine, Pripyat, a little town, had a, a nuclear expo explosion, explosion 26 April 1986. We learned that nuclear power is very, very safe. No carbon dioxide that will change the world into a greenhouse, into global warming. But unfortunately, when a reactor exploded on that day, the end looks like this. Now, still it is a ghost town. Still nothing grows there. Still people are being born with birth defects and deformed um, children, cancer, skin cancer. That was the biggest nuclear disaster that ever happened in, on the earth. I remember as I was 16 in 1986 that they found traces of that nuclear waste in butter in Italy. They found seabirds in Port Elizabeth. South Africa with traces of that nuclear waste. So that nuclear waste did not only spread in that Ukraine state. No, it was with winds, it was drifting all over the globe. And if you look in your book on page 582, radioactive fallout, contains elements like plutonium, cobalt, and strontium. Plutonium, cobalt, strontium. And what is the effect? Birth defects, <coughs> damage to the nervous system. It can be used as a terrorist threat. Radiation sickness cause premature aging and death. If the dose is fatal, death usually occurs within two months. The symptoms of radiation sickness, nausea, weakness, hair loss, skin burns, and diminished organ functions. Cancer, cancer and leukemia are considered to the primary health effects of radiation exposure. And here we, I had, I found a little poster, neurobehavioral decrements, anxiety, fatigue, and you cannot perform. Your nervous system needs to regulate your all actions. It cannot happen. Damage to the quiescent neural stem cells in the hippocampus. That is where you remember and learn. Circulatory system, nausea and vomiting, and then, of course, gonads. Your ovaries and your testes, they will have a lot of mutations in them, and all your children and offspring will have deformities. Change in the bone and muscle system, skin burns, eye cataracts. It is, uh, there's a lot of huge problems. Then we look at non-biodegradable plastics. I, all those plastic bags, the ocean, the sidewalks, the road from Ochivarongo to Vintuk. What a sad sight. But it does not look well 
But is that the biggest thing? Yes, unfortunately, not the biggest thing. Because plastics are making havoc in the marine life. We know, we all know pictures where the marine animals think it is their food, they eat it, they cannot digest it, and they die. It becomes a trap. Now, like this a poor seal is trapped in a fishing net, in fishing lines. They cannot get loose, they get weak, and they die. And uh, the ocean's end full of uh, plastics is not nice, and it sure does not smell so nice. Now, and then they are floating all over the ocean, and this floating eventually uh, uh, clog the waterways, spoil the landscapes, block drains, and it end up all over our place. Here we see a photo of, this was around this um, tortoise when it was a very young one, and as it grew, it deformed the poor tortoise. Now, by non-biodegradable plastics, the effect on the environment, litter, once used, plastic bags go into landfills or rubbish tips. They eventually find their ways in wood into waterways, park benches, and streets. And when they are burned, they release toxic fumes into the air that cause respiratory illnesses. Animals, 100,000 animals, dolphins, turtles, whales, penguins, are killed every year due to plastic bags, and we can include fishing nets. Animals ingest plastic bags and die. After the death and decomposition of the animal, the plastic stays intact and stays around for the next victim to fall to it. Petroleum is required to produce all these plastic bags, and it is a non-renewable resource. So, we are now using petroleum and it is getting more expensive every day. We know that we tried, we are buying our plastic bags, and I wonder if we will see any change um, regarding the waste of non-biodegradable plastic bags. I would love you to look on page 583 and just make sure that you know enough examples of how dangerous non-biodegradable plastic bags are for our environment. Now, grade 12, this brings us to the end of this chapter. It is a fairly easy chapter because this is important things that you can just know by yourself. But take care, when you are under pressure in an exam situation. You will not just have it. So please read carefully and make yourself question heading of the syllabus with a few bullet points that you know what does it mean, why do we call it non-biodegradable, know the meaning of the terms. Terms that I really want you to know is eutrophication. Please make a list. Eutrophication, bioaccumulation, biomagnification. What is the meaning of sewage? The meaning of radiation. The meaning of non-biodegradable and see that you can see how that will influence 
the environment. Always try to get back to an ecosystem with its food chains. And our last chapter, which we will start very soon, will help us then to see how can we contribute to save our planet. Now you have your exam questions to finish and make sure that you repeat enough to answer your exam questions. Thank you very much. population are increasing a lot at a very, very fast rate. And it is increasingly needing more food production. Now, to take you aback, food production means agriculture. And the moment when we write the word agri, culture, we are referring to the cultivation of plants and animals. Because when we go back to our ecology, we know that the plants will be the producers of food and the animals will feed on the plants. We had a food chain. And for humans to be part of this food chain, they will need plants and animals. Do you still remember that we actually said it is better to feed a population on plants? Our reason was that from each profit level to the next, only 10% of energy will be transferred. And if humans are the third part of the food chain, 10% of energy will move to that one, and only 10% of energy move or will be transferred to the human link in the food chain. 
But in order to provide food, we had to cultivate the land. And with land cultivation, it brings a problem that we had to remove plants, especially trees. We called it deforestation, to clear land so that there are space to make this land, to plant the food, and also to have the animals to live on and to feed them and to have them growing. And deforestation is changing our soil. It's causing floods that takes away soil, animals, and rests. It also have an influence on photosynthesis. We will have less absorption of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide levels will increase. Photosynthesis will be less. And that means less carbon dioxide to make food. But this means more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we know, leads to global warming, which is dangerous for our planet. But we also know that if photosynthesis are less, then we also will have less oxygen in our atmosphere. Ne? And that means less respiration. And the last one, of course, if there are not plants, there are lower rates of transpiration. And that will in transpiration, and that will influence the water cycle. Ne? Less rain. So deforestation was really a problem to us. And we also looked at, the last one was where we looked at eutrophication due to the damage that can be done by fertilizers. Fertilizers much needed to have high products, pr produce of vegetables and fruits. And unfortunately, it will have a eutrophication where the water bodies will die. So we rather look at alternatives for fertilizers. Now, we also will need pesticides. Because pesticides lower the quality of food, but it also lower the yield of a harvest. And therefore, we need to use pesticides. Now, pesticides are persistent, which means it stays in the environment, and they are non-biodegradable, which means that nothing can break it down into smaller components. One example is DDT, which is now expelled from many, many countries. They used the DDT in order to spray against mosquito lar larvae to prevent malaria. And this poison ends up in the soil and it was taken up by the, the harvest, the vegetables, the mealies, the wheat. And now it has dangerously high levels in the body of the organisms in that ecosystem. Now, sadly, if that poison is soluble in oil and fat, it will be stored 
and it will accumulate. So we say that poison accumulates in the, an organism, bioaccumulation, when it is being stored in a live body. Now we can think that if we have a little fish in a pond, and that little fish is accumulating poison in its body. Now, the next fish, that is the next part of the food chain, will eat a few of those little fish, and you can see that that accumulation is much more in his body. And the next part, which maybe is a duck on the pond, eats many of this fish. And again, there we see if she ate three of the blue fish, she has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times the amount of poison in her body. And this is how it is moving down a food chain. And each successive link of food chain has a more concentration of the poison. And we call it bioaccumulation. A biomagnification. Bioaccumulation, soluble in oils and fatty tissue, and it is stored in one organism. Biomagnification, as the food chain is being transferred, that poison is increasing. Each successive link of food chain concentration increase. Biomagnification. High concentrations can cause harm to organisms, including humans, and many of nowadays nervous diseases is linked to the poison that are found in the food that we eat. Some of the pesticides are wide spectrum, so you spray it and you hope that you can kill many pests at once. It means they are non-specific, and sadly, they will also kill the pollinators. If the pollinators are being killed of your orange orchard or of your mealy land, unfortunately, you will have no yield because the pollination, we know, is what will cause the fruit to grow and to ripen later. After a while, the pests become resistant and we will have to change the level of the poison and make it even more poisonous, killing more of other parts of the ecosystem. So, we need to use fewer pesticides and more specific pesticides. That is what we can do to decrease the amount of pesticides and do not use it so regularly so that the pests do not become resistant. Fewer pesticides and make it more specific so that it only kills specific pests. But we can also use biological control. And that brings us to our next topic. But before that, let's quickly look at bioaccumulation, increase in the concentrations of pollutants in an organism. In that organism, it increases bioaccumulating, building up. But if that building up influence the successive food change. Eventually, we have biomagnification, increase in the concentration of a pollutant in a food 
chain. Please close your eyes and see if you can repeat it. Bioaccumulation. Good. And biomagnification. And do you see the picture? This is important terminology that you need to use when you are doing a question on that. Now, we say we can use biological control. Wonderful. Biological control means use the natural enemy. Now, use a natural enemy of a pest. And you can now help the natural and enemy to have a lot of food and they can then help you to kill off the pests. So, biological control of, or biocontrol, predator or the natural enemy is used to control the number of a pest species. They will come and they will disrupt the ecological status. You remember when we did our food chains? If we have a food chain like this, and we have the pest right here, what will happen is... This is the natural enemy, and it will kill off the pest. What will happen to the producer? The producer will have increased productivity. You agree? And this one, the numbers will become less. If this number is going to become less, for a while, they will increase and then they will decrease. Wonderful. Now, we will say, because the pests are being killed, what happens then to the natural enemy? So, biological control is a very good way of getting rid of the pest without using toxic chemicals. But be very careful. If you are using a natural animal which becomes the enemy and this one is not having any enemies itself. This one do not have any enemies. This one, the natural enemy may become the pest or they will naturally become lower in numbers if they cannot find another food source. Good. So they disrupt the ecological status Many times they can only fight on the breeding cycle, like a fish in a pond that eats the mosquito larvae. They help to slower the breeding cycle. But eventually they will reduce the number um, as this enemy becomes the part of the food chain. They must be very specific in order not to eat all the, other pe all the other insects of the environment that may be a pollinator, but only attack the pest. That is important when you keep that in mind when you want to do research for a biological control. And I want to say, very important to remember, please do research. 
I'm going to write it very big there. Research will be very important. There wouldn't have been a pest if there was enough in the food chain, enough predators to help you to control the pest. But remember, we said a monoculture where there was only a few, few cubic meters of mealies and you had a few little pests that eat on that mealies, that was controllable. But now you've decided to have your whole farm changed into a mealy farm. Now, that pest will become huge. You agree? So a monoculture makes a huge pest arrive. And now you are introducing another enemy of the pest. Be careful. Do research. See if your biological control agent will only kill the pest and not all your pollinators and that your biological control agent do not become the next pest. That's why research are very, very important. The advantage of biocontrol, it only kills the pests if you did your research well. There's no resistance. So like in the poison, you have to make it more and more and more toxic. They, it, they will not build up resistance and it is a good alternative to pesticides. Some interesting ad examples are when you have a larvivorous fish that will feed on the mosquitoes. Easy, practical, cheap. They are not this little fish. You are not going to have them for food. So they are cheap. They have no food value. They should have the following characteristics. Preference for mosquito larvae over other types of food. So that they do what the, you have them for. They are small in size. They will not take over the space in the ecosystem. High reproduction rate and tolerance to pollution, temperature fluctuation, and transportation. Two species are wisely used, the gambusia, clean water, tolerate wide range of temperature, pH, and water salinities. And then the guppies, they love polluted water, but they do not like cold water. Now, so you can use them in combination or where the one that is more situate, uh, um, more adapted for the situation you need them for. Then a very interesting problem is Salvinia molesta. And you can see, we can underline it or it's written in italic. So this is the genus name and this is the species of water salad. What this Salvinia molesta will do is it will take over a whole water body. Problem. Yes, no penetration of light. So the water becomes very cold and not enough energy for the organisms living there. Also, the sun cannot penetrate for the deeper levels to do photosynthesis. And if you want to drive on it with a boat, especially a motorboat, this will hook on the propellers and it will damage your boat. So a really, really bad problem. They got the Brazilian weevil. It is native from southern, uh, South America. And this one comes in and it eats the water salad. But actually what they do is their larvae is making tunnels in the xylem and phloem of the water salad. And by doing that, they can control the numbers of the water salad. 
disadvantages is that it is very expensive to do the research. You can, you have to take a long time and see exactly what your newly introduced biocontrol agent will do to the whole ecosystem. And it needs to be carefully monitored. So the control can become a pest. And that happened where they had a problem with this beetles, the cane beetles on the sugar cane in Australia. In other countries, they used this cane toad and it worked wonderfully. But unfortunately, when they introduced this huge toads, they could not reach the beetles on the specific sugar cane in Australia. And they started to thrive there, which means this huge toad started to eat other parts of the ecosystem. And it was not a success. It actually had a huge influence to change the natural ecosystem. Grade 12, in order to have cultivate and grow food, we always will need water. And if you have huge lands, and especially in a dry country like ours, we need to irrigate. We need to have huge water bodies or pipelines that can bring the water to the lands. And there we have different types of spraying equipment to help us to irrigate the land. It is necessary to provide food. It is also not possible for photosynthesis to take place if there is not enough water. We know how important water is for the growth of any organism because it is so important in cooling down. It is important in all the metabolic processes. Water is important in transporting even inside a plant and therefore irrigation are so important. When we look at over-irrigation, it means that in order to make sure that you are on the, in the lead of production, you think that you can just give enough and more than enough water. Unfortunately, that causes soil erosion because with huge loads of water, a stream will develop and the top layer of your soil where your microorganisms live and do their important job to decompose and recycle the nutrients, that top layer will be removed. And the deeper layers with not that amount of nutrients will be on the top. Your Soil can also become waterlogged, which means that there are so much water that is attached to the water molecules and there are no oxygen and then the roots can also not continue with absorbing the water. Salinization happens when that pools of water on your soil starts to evaporate. But remember, in that soil was different mineral salts. And what happens when I have mineral salts in water and I have evaporation? The salt will stay behind. And that causes a hard crust of salts on your topsoil. Immediately, it changed the ecosystem of that particular soil. It will damage soil life. It will make the soil very salty. And what do we know about having a plant put in salt, a plant cell? The water inside the plant cell will move out due to osmosis. Excellent, grade 12. I hear you know what you are talking about. And now this salty soil removes water from your crops rather than 
provide water due to the over irrigation that you did. The crops cannot tolerate this high levels, especially due to ex-osmosis of water. And then, very expensive. Even if you think a farmer, oh, they've got water, they do pay for their water. If you have to put on huge machinery and pumps and thick pipelines, that is very expensive. And you do not want to waste the water. And that brings us to then an unsustainable use of water. It means that this resource of water, which is so scarce during many parts of our year, it is not sustainable. There will be a day that all the water can be depleted and the farmer needs to wait for a next rainy season which we are also not very sure of always. And that will bring me to the end of our whole discussion on how agriculture is important to grow food. But with this agriculture, to provide enough food, we ha really have a few problems. You remember, we deforest the land taking away trees, increasing carbon dioxide, decreasing oxygen, deplete soil. Then we need to use fertilizer in order to have higher yields. We need to use pesticides in order to prevent the pests eating up our crops and harvest. And then even with giving water, the influence that a human has on the land is scary. And if we are only a few farming sustainably, wonderful. But now the numbers increase, poverty increase. We need to make more money in order to stay alive, in order to feed all the poor people. And that brings huge problems to our beautiful planet the earth. And remember what it, Chief Seattle said, we are merely a string in the web of life, not the life itself. We need to become part of the system and help with the answers and the solutions. Thank you, Grade 12. In Australia. And with that, I just want to conclude today so that you can do your worksheets. Enjoy, take care, grade 12. About the day you found out you had COVID. The day I found out I had COVID. Hmm. It's a difficult day. I didn't understand how I got COVID because I was always covered. I was always with my hand sanitizer. It came with my wife. 
And that whole day, I was thinking, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to survive. My kids. I was losing my tasting, smelling. There were some days I would test my taste buds and put like four or five chilies in my coffee. No way. I didn't taste it. So did you also lose your appetite in the process? It was very funny. In the first week, no, I was chowing. I was chowing like I will wake up like midnight and <laughs> make for me something. But after the first week, then the appetite was gone. When you go to bed, your body is also automatically switching off. And that's a dangerous time for COVID. It's like glass pinching you, cutting you inside your lungs. Then the heart was pumping like, like rabbit pumps. You are losing a lot of fluids at night. Is that through fever or what? Yeah, it's through fever. So have you experienced any side effects from having contracted COVID-19? No, not yet. Maybe it's still coming, but not yet. And your wife? She was complaining about light head. It's an annoying headache. It's light, but it's annoying. So basically, you didn't take any prescribed medicine from the doctor to recover no. from COVID? No, I didn't. The only thing I was using is desperate for my blood not to clot. Because for some people, when your lungs are really, really infected, your blood will start to clot from the lungs, close all the airways. That's where we are passing. I'm smoking cigarette, and when you were a smoker, and COVID in your lungs now. So then after you found out, you both found out you had COVID, um, what did you guys do to protect the kids? The kids move out from the house. The booties will come, then we will collect everything for them and just put for them outside when they came. Just grab the food and go. So what was the biggest battle for you? Was it mental or physical? Mentally. Mentally was the biggest battle. I'm actually an international movie maker and my career was cut off. I couldn't put bread on the table. There were some days we mm. have one meal for the day then went to bed. And that was hitting me in my mind. What if blessing get corona now? Where am I going to go? Who can I help? There were also some people depend on us in the rural areas. We couldn't help them. My future was black. Dark, dark, dark. I couldn't even see that small light at the end of the tunnel. One day, my daughter decided now, I want to see my father today. And I just told her, yeah, she can come. The first words was, Daddy, I was praying for you yesterday night. Don't worry, Corona will go back soon. And I was asking, from where, from Namibia? He said, no, not from Namibia, from you. And you are not looking good. And she was actually a heartbroken. Until today, she hates Corona. From there, then I was like, oh, okay. If the smallest one is saying this, why am I not? picking me up self and do the right thing and get rid of this thing. That's where I started to run, to practice, coming to my quiet place. And actually the main thing that broke my heart during that time was there was no one. The time of COVID, there was no, no one. So can you tell us where we are right now? We are at my silent place. I call this place my silent place. I will come here when the COVID is hitting me like 120%. Looking at the ocean, then you will hear voices like, no, you don't belong here. Today, you don't belong here. Get up and go home. Some days they will nurse you like, no, you will survive. 
Your future is a bright future. You must not give up now. Think about your kids, think about the people around you. Even the wind will do that. Actually, you must meditate. The thing of COVID is, looks like COVID is afraid of the warmness and is friends with the coldness. So the whole time you are baking in the sun, it helps a lot. So is that what you did? Yeah, I did. I will do that twice a day. This was uh, supposed to be a, a golden year for me, a very, very good golden year for me. But then COVID decided, no, this is not going to be your golden year. Everything was cancelled. We, the fellow makers, this year, from the international shoots, lost a lot of, lot of money. You've lost three family members? Is it all due to COVID? No, not all due to COVID. First one, my sister, she was very close to me. She contracted COVID April, and she was in ICU for three months. The COVID damaged her lungs, and at that stage her lungs collapsed, and she couldn't breathe without the machines. Her kidneys failed, her liver has failed. COVID is real. First of all, COVID is real. It's not a joke. Most of the people, they fall away from COVID regulations. Still early to fall away from COVID regulations. We must still go in line with those COVID regulations. And how long did you say it took you to recover? Three weeks. 21 days. What must somebody do to change your mind from that negative perspective to that positive? positive. COVID, no job. It's very dangerous. There was one day I just decided I'm going to take a rope, go to the jetty, sit around there, and after all I will hang there by the jetty. The time I arrived here, there was no wind, out of nowhere. The ocean was like angry, angry, and it started to get cold. And I was like, but it was just nice weather. Then I sat down. Then the universe will talk with you, the wind, the sun, the ocean. That's the main thing of COVID. If you don't save yourself, no one will save you. And we must always appreciate what we have around us. That's the main thing in COVID. If you don't appreciate what you have around you, now you lose your head. Smile, smile, smile. When you walk with me, I just want you to smile, smile. My industry and what I've done with my hands in Namibia, it's going all over the world and here you are Babaji, you want to quit now. I'm excited for 2021. It's not going to be the same like 2020 now. I'm making back in the groove. <laughs> Nothing else, no matter. You're my moonlight in my oven. Let all my sins be forgiven. 